Ciao e grazie. Grazie. Sorry, my Italian is long way off. I just they're over there. <laughs> I'd like to thank you, and I'd especially like to thank Code Motion for having me back again. And yes, I'm supposed to stay here so the camera can see me. Um, I apologize to the cameraman in advance. I do wander, so I apologize. Uh, I'll drive you crazy, I'm sure. I'm here this year to talk to you about data breaches. And you're like, OK, great. This is a develop app developer course, why, or conference, rather. Why am I talking about data breaches? Because so many problems that we have with data breaches today really can be fixed before they ever become any sort of issue. Ah, there we go. So a quick background about myself. Um, I have been doing uh, computer security in any sh shape or form for about 25 years now. I've done everything from when I started out as an, a rapid application developer for a bank back in the 90s to being a, a CISO for a power company at one point. And it has been quite an adventure along the way because I've learned a lot of lessons. I've also made lots of mistakes. Um, and one thing that I always make a point of uh, uh, addressing when I meet uh, any audience in the world, I always mention that I am Canadian. It seems my cousins to the south really kind of tend to annoy a lot of people. So I just want to make it very clear that I am a Canadian. These days, I now work for a company called Akamai Technologies. How many people in the room here are actually familiar with Akamai? Oh, okay, that's actually a pretty good number. So it was really interesting because I saw a presentation recently where this gentleman was going on and on about how he did all these really cool things with his application to protect his enterprise. At no point did he mention the fact that he was using us in front of his application in order to stay online. It was really rather an interesting conversation. I didn't bust him during his presentation. I won't say who it was or when it was. But it was really kind of curious. It's like, oh, yes, we did all these really cool things with the open, open source tools. Meanwhile, they have the 800-pound gorilla in front of their website. That's as far as I'll go with that. So one of the really interesting things when you're looking at all of these data breach stories that you see in the news is that there are some commonalities and there's also some lack of commonalities. There's a commonality in that everybody is always going, oh, look at that. That's horrible. That's a dumpster fire. And you get the random GIFs on. Twitter that talk about these sort of things, but the one thing that we don't have is a common lingua franca. We do not have a common language where we can talk about data breaches in a coherent fashion. And when I uh, examining these, last year I went through all of the publicly available data breaches for 2016. I read them all. It's okay. I read them all and it was absolutely mind-numbing. And one of the things I learned very quickly when you read roughly 500 of these documents is there is not enough coffee in the world to save you. And just because I'm an absolute and complete and total masochist, I'm now going through and doing them all for 2017. Um, I need a hobby. So one of the things that I've learned as I'm going through these things is that there is no commonality. There is no understanding as to what is exactly is a data breach. Case in point, the recent news that we saw with the Cambridge Analytica breach. And people say, oh, it wasn't a data breach, it was a breach of trust. It's still a breach. The data that was supposed to be protected, that was supposed to be you know, taken care of and accountable for that data, went to a party it wasn't supposed to be. It is a breach. And that's the sum total of it. But the really funny thing is when you're having these conversations and reading these documents, you find that not everybody agrees on what is the meaning of the word is. So. One of the things that I learned very early on when I was in school, I was taking a degree in classical antiquities and archaeology. So, of course, one of my favorite subjects was ancient Rome. And I found it's really interesting to find this corollary to match up with what I'm doing today is the sack of Rome in 410 AD. This was a case where it was the original denial of service, where the Visigoths showed up, parked outside, and cut off the city until they finally just threw open the doors and said, we give up. And this is one of those things where I'm seeing this replayed time and again. So if we go back here to 2005, here's a great example where a data breach dumped 40 million credit card numbers. This should have been a learning opportunity. Now, one thing I should highlight as I'm going through this is I will mention various companies in here that have been breached. There is nothing that I'm going to discuss that isn't public record. And if you see a company in here that you happen to work for, please don't take this as a negative. This is a learning opportunity. This is not a case of vilifying whoever got breached because that doesn't win anybody any points. Now, 
we jump back in time again, we go look at 2009 with the Heartland uh, data breach where uh, uh, 40 million uh, transactions were dumped out here and there was a character by the name of Alberto Gonzalez who was able to reach their systems and dump everything using simple SQL injection commands as well as using a particular uh, function that was built into many SQL databases at the time. This was a function called XP Command Shell. This was actually something that was built in there. It was by design to allow database administrators to administrate their database remotely. Unfortunately, there was no security in place as it applied to this, and as a result, all those breaches that I mentioned earlier were able to happen. At one company that I was working for, we had a pen test where the attackers came in, well, hired attackers, came in and they tried to breach our systems. One of the first things they tried to do was XP command shell. And I'm sitting there watching my intrusion detection system, and I'm like, ha I see you, and I called them up, and I said, yeah, that's not going to work. They got mad because they thought somebody on their team told me what they were doing. I'm like, no, I actually have the data in front of me. And this is one of those things, is when you read these stories about all these data breaches, you've got to understand what is behind them. Because these days, instead of having in-depth thought pieces that you used to get in newspapers, now you're getting clickbait. People want you to see their articles so they can move ads, and so on and so forth. So you've got to ask, what is the data behind it? And why do these things keep happening? And we flash forward to more recent times. This was an example here of a uh, U.S. defense contractor called Booz Allen Hamilton. They were breached because they had an S3 bucket in Amazon that was publicly accessible. How many people in here are familiar with S3 buckets in Amazon? Okay. If you are developing an application that uses an S3 bucket in any way, shape, or form, please understand that if you set it to publicly available, bad things can happen. By default, this is disabled. Let me say that again. By default, public access to S3 buckets is disabled. You have to manually set it so that people can use this. But unfortunately, too many companies see this as an issue. Here's another example where Verizon had all sorts of credentials that were exposed externally because their S3 bucket was publicly available. And when we see these stories, we don't go, okay, well, that's bad. Beyond that, I mean, we don't learn from it. We don't internalize it because it isn't something that we can relate to. And it isn't something relatable until somebody breaches your own property, breaches your house, your company, whatever it happens to be. It has to be something personalized. And this is something we have to grow beyond. This is something where we have to learn because otherwise we end up with a data breach like everybody else. Now imagine your house gets broken into, but you and 100 million of your closest friends have their information all exposed as a result of that. This is one of those things that when we're developing applications, we want to make sure that security is baked in from the very beginning. I used to have a, a, a team with a financial institution in Canada where any project that was going to be internet facing had to come through my team. One of the things that we did was make sure all the security protocols were gone through and everything was taken and tested and made sure that it was ready for production and it wasn't a case of, oh, we'll fix it and prod. That never works. And we had Company, or groups within the, the organization would come to us with these applications that were broken so badly that my four-year-old son could breach them. My nine-year-old daughter could completely destroy them and put them up on the Washington Post, but that's another thing entirely. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm doomed. One thing that we really have to understand, understand is data is now currency. There is value associated with data no matter what your organization is. And the thing is, attackers are going to come after your systems whether or not you're making teddy bears or you're making uh, centrifuges. These are the things you have to understand is just by virtue of the fact you have an IP address that's attached to the internet, the attackers are going to come looking for you. There's a tool that was written by a friend of mine, Robert Graham. He works for a company called Eratosec in, uh, in the US called MassScan. MassScan is a tool that you can scan the entire internet in four hours. All of it. It's an extremely effective tool, and obviously it drives pe people nuts when he starts scanning. And the best part is, is we actually have a rule for him in our own networks where we actually see it, and a little flag pops up. It's like, Rob's at it again. This is the thing. It has gotten far easier for attackers to do what they need to do. And don't think for a second that because you're making whatever it is you're making, that people aren't going to come looking for you. Understand that is a problem. And especially when you look at things like S3 buckets, that's an avoidable problem. Making these things publicly accessible is going to cause you heartache. To the point where I wrote this article back in November, 
And I actually went through and I took screenshots from AWS and I showed how it was actually done. By default, not enabled. Unfortunately, this keeps popping up over and over again. Just yesterday, I found out about a company in Thailand who exposed 50,000 credentials because of a publicly addressed, uh, public accessible um, bucket. Okay, so another thing that I've been hearing a lot about in over and over again, besides you know the blockchain, we're, we're, what was that bingo card from the last talk? Uh, blockchain, dark web, da 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 da. AI and machine learning. This is the stuff that keeps coming up in the time and again. Now, if I have a hammer, I can build you a house. Eventually, that is part of it. And you have to understand that AI and machine learning are tools. They are not silver bullets. And we tend to get fixated with these sort of things because we think, ooh, shiny. But we're not there yet. We're getting there. Now, uh, one of the things that I, uh, I'm lucky enough to do is I work as part of the speaker operations team for DEF CON in Las Vegas every year. And two years ago, before the conference got rolling, we had these things set up for the DARPA Grand Challenge. Each one of these systems across the, uh, the stage here was roughly about you know, seven feet tall, and these were supercomputers that were competing against each other. These things were liquid-cooled. So we had to walk behind the stage, and there were these huge water pipes going across the floor, and all I could think was something's going to go horribly wrong. Now, each one of these systems had rules of engagement. They were told, this is how you're supposed to behave. AI decided in one of these systems that it was going to go, mm, yeah, no, I'm going to try something totally different. It wrote an exploit that nobody had ever seen before. So, when you think about it, AI is great for whatever application you're developing. Also understand the attackers are going to be leveraging these tools as well. And in some cases, AI may get creative. And it's not like anything bad would ever happen as a result of that. Is this going to work? Zip. Hello. All right, never mind. And my slide deck is completely locked up on me. Fantastic. I might have been popped. That's always a possibility. It wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> All right, this is a new one. All right, so let's see if I can go right here. All right, okay. So when you're looking at these sort of systems and think about these sort of things, you have to look at it as, you know, how are you protecting the data with the applications you're writing? Are you making sure that you're taking steps to protect the data? Because things like this can happen. Who here has heard about the Equifax data breach? That affected Folks in the US, Canada, UK, and I'm sure beyond that, but that's how much they've come forward with, with so far. And there was talks about it was a vulnerability in an underlining framework, uh, struts. But the reality is it didn't have to be that complicated. Now, the particular vulnerability they had, there was a Metasploit module, and Metasploit is a framework for doing automated attacks. This here, however, was a web interface that was available in 26 different countries where you could actually log in with a username admin and a password of admin and get the exact same data that apparently they breached using this uh, vulnerability. So, unauthorized access, insider threat, and web breaches. These are the things that we read about in the news a fair bit, but one thing they never really talk about is the missing patches. And this is one of those things where you go, okay, what are we, why are we missing these sort of things? So let me see if I can keep this going here. And we're back. All right, cool. Um, one of the best data breach uh, stories I've ever seen is a movie called Rogue One. And if you haven't seen this movie, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling anything for you, but it's been a while. So when you're looking at this movie, how many people are familiar with this movie? Okay, that's enough. That's good. <laughs> so with the, we look at it, we had in one particular scene, we have the firewall admin. He's taking care of access into the environment. And he looks at it and he said, well, no, I'm not really sure. You're not supposed to be here. The authentication doesn't really seem to check out. And the pilot says, well, actually, we are the folks that are supposed to be here. And they go, oh, okay, well, send us your code. All right, cool. So they send their code, which is very much analogous to SQL injection. And then, well, that's successful. And then they're able to breach the network. Now, the real problem here is that once the breach happens, by many different types of reports, it's usually 100 to 200 days, depending on who you're talking about, before anybody notices the attackers in your environment. 
This is why we have to be very diligent about making sure that we have secure code and secure applications so that we're not making it easier for the attackers. And even the folks that are supposed to know these sort of things, this happens to the best of them. And this is a perfect example where Deloitte themselves were actually uh, compromised and their clients' emails were dumped. So once the attackers are inside your environment, one of the first things they want to do is they want to escalate their privilege. They want to be able to gain access to more information that they wouldn't have necessarily had before they got in. And when you're sitting there and you start seeing things are going a little bit strange on your network, you're looking at it going, hmm, that's not supposed to happen. But by that point, the attackers have already done the damage. And then all of a sudden, they're trying to grab your data and get out of your environment. By the time you realize this, it's a little bit too late because there goes your data, it's gone. It is broadcast to the world, and the next time you find out about it is on the front page of whatever your local newspaper happens to be. The most valuable lesson from this particular movie was what? They didn't encrypt the data. So I was imagining if you're going to build something that can kill a planet, you're probably going to take the time to protect that data, especially if you don't want folks to know about it. But that being what it is, I had to throw that one in there for amusement. So now I run another site on the side called liquidmatrix.org, which I've been running now for 20 years. I can't believe I can say that. Now back in 2012, one of the things I started doing was I started tracking these data breaches because there were more and more of them popping up and I noticed a rather sickly pattern. I had no idea how much this was going to grow over time, but it was really interesting. I was like going, okay, wow, 6.4 million records. At that point, that was huge, or so I thought. Now, as we move on, I realized that you know, anybody is susceptible to these sort of things. Case in point, this was a company I was working for, and for those of you who can see who up in the top URL, I won't say it out loud, I was working at this organization. We had this one marketing uh, group that had a WordPress system that was sitting outside the firewall. And they said, oh, you know, that system's not, we don't need that anymore. And then I said, as a security team, we said, can you please take it down, take it offline? It is a problem because it's running a deprecated version of WordPress. A little bit of a problem. They said, sure, no problem. A couple weeks later, the phone starts ringing and multiple news organiza organizations want to talk to us and say, oh, you've been popped. And we're like, oh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So this group, Root Bear Sec, was going around at the time and compromising basically anything they could get their hands on, and they were able to do it using SQL injection against a deprecated version of WordPress. The problem here wasn't the marketing team. The problem here was we as a security team didn't follow through. This was an avoidable problem if we had actually closed the loop with them and made sure that that system had been taken offline, or as I like to do in the past, walk over and pull the ethernet cable on it and move on. But this was something where it was minimal impact to us as an organization. We had 192 accounts on there that were local to that box. There was nothing within our enterprise, but the fact that this made it into the press cycles, that was a problem from a perspective to the wider audience. And it did affect the stock for a day or two. But thankfully, it bounced back. And the reason things like this work is like this. For example, this is from uh, our State of the Internet report that we do at Akamai every quarter. It's free, so it's not a vendor thing. Um, this is from our data from about 250,000 systems around the world. And we notice SQL injection, local file inclusion, cross-site scripting. Top three attacks every quarter that we see coming across our platform. Why? SQL injection works. If you're not sanitizing your inputs and sanitizing your in outputs, you run the real risk of having your data end up on a headline like too many others, myself included. And just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. This is back in what year was this? Oh, uh, yes, 2014. There was an, a social media app that came out called Yo. I have no idea if they're even still around today, but they had the challenge amongst a bunch of friends. They said, how about we write this? We'll see how fast we can do it. In eight hours, they were able to act, run this, uh, write this app, put it up, and it was online and operational. Not long after that, they were completely compromised and all the credentials were dumped online. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. You have to make sure that security is baked in from the beginning. Sanitize your inputs, sanitize your outputs, now, this is something that 
I keep hammering on about security being a big p piece of the puzzle because back in the 90s, I was part of a team of two folks where we were writing the mobile uh, banking application for the Royal Bank of Canada, two of us. And we had actually factored in security into the database, security into the application. So this was not something that anybody told us. There were no websites going on about this. This was something that we just inherently knew. And little did we know how much of an issue that was going to be going into the future, especially when you look back at the cavalcade of SQL injection attacks that were successful. And this is just a short example from historical. Now, if we go back to a year ago, this here is a screenshot from a site called informationisbeautiful.net, really, really cool data visualization site. Now, here, what they did was take all of the data breaches, and the orange color just means they were newsworthy at the time beyond the obvious fact that they got popped. This was a year ago. Flash forward to, to this morning. This is a real problem, and this is why I keep harping on SQL injection as an issue. We can fix this. This is something that is within our ability to do. Otherwise, you end up like things like this. 143 million people who did not elect to be part of this database had all of their data dumped. I was one of them happy. And it always almost feels like people are like, oh, yes, we want a data breach too. And at one point, uh, one of the organizations I work with, Securosis LLC, we were tracking data breaches and we found that organizations that were breached, that were publicly traded, we found that their stock actually went up after the data breach. It was the most surreal thing. And we weren't really sure what it is and maybe it was the security controls they were using, but the other thing is we have to understand is that there are security debt issues that we have to take into account as well because things like this will happen. WannaCry was a ransomware piece that broke out worldwide, leveraging a problem that could have been fixed 10 years ago. SMB version 1 did not need to exist. So this is one of those things where when we're developing applications, we want to make sure we're not using deprecated libraries, we're not using things that we don't have to use that'll introduce problems that the law of unintended consequences will gladly leverage. And when you are breached, you have to look at the costs of your incident. So when you're looking at if the, the event your systems are breached or your network is breached, what is the cost of remediating the findings from the post-mortem? Cost to recovery, what do you got to do to build out again? If you were the company Sony Pictures who was compromised, they had all their systems destroyed down to bare metal. They were using Sharpies and whiteboards because that was all they had left that worked. You want to look at the communication costs that you're dealing with your external environment. You're talking to the media, talking to stakeholders. Who are you talking to first? What is the message you're going to be uh, putting outwards publicly? Because you have to understand that if you don't get in front of the narrative, the media will gladly take it in ways that you never thought was possible. When we went through that, uh, vulnerability or that WordPress database at that one company I worked at, the media just started going off in ludicrous different angles because we hadn't managed the message well. And boy, that was a valuable lesson to take away. And you also got to look at the possibility of legal fees because, well, there's a lot of litigious countries in the world. And the idea of loss of revenue, customer attrition, and stock valuation. One company I worked at years ago, we had this email that was sent out by the CEO saying, fire bad, things are horrible, don't share this email. We had an email filtering system in place that nobody told us to turn on at the point because we didn't know that email was coming, and we found 27 people sent that email out to external parties, three of them to the press. Our stock dropped 20% in one day because of that one email. So you got to understand that things can go horribly wrong that you may not have ever conceived of. And when you're looking at the cost of data breaches, this is a great example. Uh, Yahoo was looking to be purchased by Verizon, and Verizon gave it a $350 million US haircut because they had not actually been forthright about the data breach that they had. Further to that end, we got to look at things like TalkTalk. TalkTalk was not actually encrypting the records in their database. When they got breached, their reaction was, what do we have to encrypt for? Nobody told, we had, told us we had to encrypt. That ended up with a 400,000 pound fine but can you imagine what would have happened if this was after May 25th of this year? And I'll get to that in a second. And you have to ask yourself is, if you're collecting data in your application, do you need the data? 
Case in point, external storage and read external storage. So read and write into external storage with your application if you don't need it. Like, I won't say which application that is, but the high likelihood is there's a lot of people in this room using it right now. Because May 25th, GDPR, GDPR is coming along. Now, GDPR, from a security perspective, is fantastic because this actually deals with accountability and stewardship for data. This is something that should have been done a long time ago. And thank you to Europe for making the rest of us become adults because this is long overdue. Because unfortunately, things like this are going to happen. After the Equifax breach, the hack was discovered. And then it was discovered there was massive insider trading. And then the news broke shortly thereafter. And a lot of people got in trouble. And this is not good stewardship. This is not good corporate uh, fiduciary responsibility. And you have to understand that bad things are going to happen. So who got the pink slip? In Canadian parlance, this means that you got fired. So the CISO, he retired, or sorry, she retired. The CIO retired. And the CEO retired with a $90 million payout. I'm obviously in the wrong business because wow. But this is just one example of many. Their close competitor, Experian, had this happen to them shortly thereafter. Let's see if this is going to run. Whoop. There we go. Oh, no. Three, two, one. Love it when the demos work. <laughs> All right, give it up. Anyway, suffice it to say, they were actually serving up a malicious version of Flash that they were trying to get you install in your system that they had no part in. Unfortunately, somebody had compromised their system. So when you're looking at things, when you're developing your applications, when you're working with your security teams, you want to make sure that you are working with all the different stakeholders. One of the great stakeholders that everybody loves to avoid is compliance. Compliance can actually be a huge ally. You can get them to help bounce ideas off and uh, look at it from a different perspective. As opposed to being adversarial, make them a partner for when you're developing your applications so that you avoid the problems when you try to go into production. Because far too often, when I was working at that one financial institution, when we would have applications come to us, they would always say, oh, we have to go live in 12 hours. And I'm like, well, where were you when we tried to book meetings with you two months ago? These are things that you can avoid if you plan accordingly. Now, things can and will go wrong. And this is a bit of a tangent, but this is one of the things I enjoy from a data breach perspective. I was working for a defense contractor in the United States, and we had a rather busy character that was trying to break into the system to the point where I got annoyed and I decided I was going to hit them back. So I launched my own attack. I got into their systems. And I didn't break anything, but I left a note. And I said, we really appreciate it if you would stop launching attacks. These are the reasons, the reasons you have to fix your system. And here's a burner email address that you can send me back a note. <sighs> 24 hours later, I got an email back. They said, hey, well, thank you for all the really interesting things. We didn't even know that these were problems in our systems. And by the way, wrong target. What? I looked. I had actually gotten one of the octets wrong in the IP address, and I had gone after the wrong target. So one of the things that I'm seeing a lot more in Europe and North America is more and more talk about hack back within different types of security legislation. And this is one of those things that I really worry about because the wrong target can be taken out. So your application, if it is not securely coded, could very much get popped by accident. So another example that I love that uh, with data breaches is not so much a data breach as an oops. And when I was working for one particular company, we had a um, vulnerability scanning vendor come to us and say, look, we will scan an entire IP uh, block of yours for free just to give you an example of how our tool works. I'm like, meh, no skin off my nose. I'll try it. Here's my class B. And they went, what? Class B? OK. So they agreed to it. They scanned our entire class B. And damn if they didn't get one of the octets wrong in the IP address. I started flipping through the report. And I'm seeing printers. And I know, I know we don't have any printers exposed externally. And I'm looking at the locations, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen. They had managed to scan an entire block of IP space in China because they got one octet wrong and 
they were very embarrassed about the whole thing, and I won't name them because it was an honest mistake, but this is just it. An honest mistake is very easy to make. Now, in addition to my role of looking at uh, applications at the bank, and one power company I was working at, we had to look at uh, an application. And the first thing that I did when I saw this web app was I went view source, as one does, just see what things are going on. And one of the first things I saw was commented out in the code, username, admin, password, password. One would hope. This was actually the most bizarre one I had ever seen. So just to give you an example, so I did view, source, right there, just blink it just to make sure I'm very clear about this. Would you like to know what the manager for the application development team said to me? You hacked our system. My exact reaction was this, but thankfully I kept that internalized. And I was very clear that I didn't shoot my foot off because I realized this wasn't a problem with the application developer. This was a problem with myself and my own team because we had not successfully communicated to them the security ramifications of things they were doing within their applications. Unfortunately, this application had already gone live, so we had to roll this back to suite. They hadn't actually come through and validated any of their code or any of their systems with us at all. And unfortunately, it was horribly broken beyond that. Now, this is one of those learning moments where you make sure that you bake security in at the beginning because it can be extremely expensive on the other end. Case in point, when you leave a company, Things don't always go the way you think. You build this beautiful monster, you leave, you go to a brand new shiny job and somebody drops you an email and says, hey, Dave, check this out. So, one particular website at a former company, if you can see it up there, if you put the variable of Etsy password, it would dump the password for the server to a public web page. Fantastic. So no matter what you build, what you develop, you have to understand that folks are going to learn how to use your tools in ways that you never anticipated. They are going to do strange, strange things. And they're going to ask for things that don't make sense. Case in point, this will tell you exactly nothing, but it looks pretty. Thankfully, this particular company is gone. And you have to understand that security vendors make mistakes too. This is a company that the first time I ever gave this talk, this happened literally about 20 minutes before I gave my talk. This was a database security company that unfortunately got popped, never did find out what exactly happened to them. And this isn't to make them feel bad, but this is to show this could happen to literally anyone. And speaking of anyone, my friend Bob Lord was in this situation when he was at Yahoo. They got breached rather badly, and unfortunately it wasn't on his watch, but he had to deal with the fallout. This was a billion records. <clears throat> And things are going to happen that you never imagined. The Morris Worm is a great example. How many people here have heard of the Morris Worm from back in the days? Oh, wow. Okay, so the Morris Worm was the first basically malicious worm to ever be released on the Internet. And it was not designed to be malicious, but because of the way it operated and propagated, it actually took out a couple hundred thousand servers in rather short order. And this is one of those things where you have to make sure your code is sound before you push to production. Don't fix and prod, that, that doesn't work. Now, this ends up making security people rather stabby and we trying to run around trying to attack problems, but this is one of those things where we don't want to align against ourselves. We want to make sure that we're working together as a team. Now, speaking of working together as a team, one great thing that you can do to work, to help build out your own systems is work with your internal audit team. I used to hate these folks. They were folks that would literally give me agita, but, when I was dealing with them, over time, I realized that they were actually a great ally to be working with once I got past the us versus them mentality. They can help you test your breach, plan, breach response plan. They can look at the risks and benefits of sharing information. They can also work with compliance. And these folks are usually the adults in the room because security folks, let's face it, we like to run around with mohawks and break into things because we can. Somebody has to be the adult in the room because when it comes time to talk externally about what happened, you have to make sure you have a clear and coherent message going forward. Because if you don't have a proper crisis communications plan when things go wrong, then it could get far worse because, as I mentioned before, the, me the press is more than willing to build its own narrative in a vacuum. 
Now, another thing that we always read about in the news is the wonderful thing of the zero-day vulnerability. This is usually not a something that I like to spend a whole lot of time worrying about. The ones that I really worry about are the 100-day vulnerabilities. The SQL patch that has been out for two years from a quarterly revision that was not applied because the DBA said the database is mine. This is one of those problems where you have to make sure that you're not accumulating a level of security debt that is completely unmanageable because otherwise things like Heartbleed happen, things like uh, WannaCry happen. These are all problems that could have been addressed years ago, but because we weren't looking in the right direction, we were chasing all the fires, we didn't look at the, the debt that was accumulating. So what do you do? Easiest way is to start where you are. You want to build out a risk register for your environment, and I understand that most of you aren't security practitioners, but when you're dealing with your application, you're going to know that there are some security-related issues. And work with your security team internal to your organization to find out how can I track these. Make sure that you're going to building to a resolution with these problems, because otherwise they could come back to haunt you in the long term. Sure, the folks can write off letters where they accept the risk, but that doesn't always work out. You want to make sure you're applying patches in a judicious fashion. Patching, I know, is not easy. I've worked in enough enterprises to know that it's not as simple as just patch it, as far too many people like to say, but you want to make sure that you have some sort of plan to tackle this. If you're promoting new code into your environment, is, is something going to go horribly wrong? Case in point, I found a vulnerability in a Cisco product, oh god damn, that was about 10 years ago now, and I was testing it and I shared it with Cisco and they came back with a patch, and I applied the patch and I ran it, Little did I, I'm busy at the moment. Little did I know that when I ran the uh, ran the application again, I still had uh, what was called Peros proxy, which is basically a man in the middle type proxy where I could check the code. It was still running, and I caught another issue. I was able to inject commands through this, the SSL library at the time because the patch that they provided fixed the problem, but introduced a brand new problem. So this is one of those things you want to make sure you're testing before you give it back to the security researcher. You want to make sure that you're tackling your security threats earlier. Are you looking at the DNS in your environment? Are you looking at the DNS as, as it applies to your application? Are you looking at data exfiltration, data leaving your application? Not just coming into your application, but leaving your application. What is going out the front door? You want to look at code reviews, web application firewalls, DDoS protection, all those wonderful things, because you want to look at it in a layered approach because everybody wants you to build the next big thing because they always want you to innovate. You want to come out with the new shiny, but you want to make sure you're doing it in a cohesive fashion because you can't build the plane while it's already in flight because this will lead you to all sorts of war stories. And one case in point was I was running a particular system in my environment. I didn't want to let anybody else touch it. Didn't want them to patch it, administer it, nothing because I didn't have the confidence level that anybody could do it the way I did it. This was a huge failing on my part. Ultimately, I had a mentor who said, you've got to let it go. Sometimes if you're building something, you've got to let other people take it over because that allows you to grow it as a practitioner as well. Once I let it go, they actually had to hire two more people to run the application, but there's a whole other ballgame. And bad things are always going to happen. Uh, one particular example was I was working in one company where we had a globally distributed network where one of our offices was in Southeast Asia and they had figured out a way to tunnel through our security controls um, doing the most interesting things so they could download all sorts of cracked movies. And we were getting letters from MPAA, RIA, all the rest of it, and they were saying, you got to stop doing this. And we're like, there's nothing in our files. And then when we went to the location and looked and we found how they had done it, it was rather ingenious. Because again, people are, are always going to use the tools that you provide them in ways that you never expected. And things are always that way. And this one closing story that I will share was an example of a power company I was working at. We had previously been one large company, split into five smaller companies. And in this one company, we had a routing issue. We went looking around. We couldn't figure out what it was. We lifted a tile in the data center, nothing. Lifted another tile. Third tile we lift up, there's a router under the floor blinking back at us that nobody knew about. This was a router that had been there since before the companies had been severed into five separate entities. It was still communicating back to one of our companies that was sister companies that was now a competitor. They didn't know about it either. Exactly. They didn't know about it either, which was fantastic, but both of us were like, oh, geez. We took it out very quickly, 
But this is one of those things is as you're building your application, as you're building anything in your environment, as you're looking at the data that you have, you want to make sure that you're doing stuff in a secure fashion because if you miss a step somewhere along the way, eventually that's going to be your router looking back at you. That being said, I would really like to thank you all for putting up with me again this year. Uh, thank you to Code Motion for having me. And uh, if you want to drop me an email or find me on Twitter, that's where I can be found. <laughs>